In last week's episode, we talked about how the media may or may not influence your opinion and talked about three different media theories, the hypodermic needle, two-step flow, and uses and gratifications. Let's see what you had to say. Dave F. Russ gets to a really interesting subtext of this episode, which is the metaphor of treating uh, media as a consumable good as opposed to uh, a thing that you constitute and interact with. And we talked about this actually in depth in the uh, hot and cold media episode, that this is you know another way to look at media. Is it something that you consume uh, the way that we treated it in last week's episode, or is it something that you interact with and through the interaction you allow that thing to become what it intends to be? And I think that this is maybe just the subject of another uh, But Wait episode, is what are the metaphors that allow us to think and talk about media? Um, and I think, you know, media as consumable good, which is the metaphor that all three of those theories rely on, is, you know, probably a, a very, it's a, a very common one and a very, very powerful one. Nicholas Leidendorf and Amy Dentata get to another subtext of these three theories, which is how the people who control the media or make the editorial decisions that comprise the media decide what does and does not actually get put in front of their audience. And uh, this does have a name, it's called Gatekeeper, uh, the Gatekeeper Theory. Uh, those people would be called, you know, gatekeepers and is, yeah, another, another part of uh, the way that you are sort of appraised of the state of the world, that if something doesn't get through a gatekeeper, then you don't know that it's even a thing worth knowing about. I mean, that's, you know, and that, again, like like these three theories, uh, the gatekeeper theory also sort of really changes when you start talking about how the internet works. Oh, cripes. I'm just wearing sunglasses inside. Harry T. Dyer asks a really good question about cultivation theory, which is the theory that the more people watch, um, television is sort of where this theory starts. Uh, the more people watch basically narratives, fictional narratives that look sort of like the real world, the more that they think that is what the world is like and the more that they accept those depictions of reality as uh, truth, sort of unquestioningly. And I think that, you know, I'm along the same lines that, that you are, Harry, that this is a thing that I think holds sway in uh, certain places and with certain people, but of course doesn't have, you know, uh, doesn't have a perfect effectiveness across all media messages and all um, all audiences. I do think that um, it is incredibly effective when it comes to the news. And I think that we often forget that the news is a sort of real-time narrativization of history. It's just we don't normally think of those things as history because it's, you know, current events, things that are happening right now. Uh, but I do think that, that there is there is maybe an amount of acceptance for news media um, as a direct reflection of what is real um, and uh, sort of a, a portrait of how the world is that we should question, we, the, so the unclear we, uh, should question more often. Harry also gets into some sort of like mere exposure effect territory talking about how, you know, maybe minions are as popular as they are because you see them so often that you kind of have to like them a little bit in order to deal with, uh, with their ubiquity. And I think that this is, I always think about this when there's a new summer blockbuster coming out, that there is this very fine line for advertising presence, that when something is present but not ever present, I think that you can guess that it's a good movie, but as soon as it becomes ever present, I think that you can pretty safely assume it's a bad movie. And I felt this way about uh, X-Men Apocalypse, that I was excited to go see, but then every time I went outside, it felt like every billboard, every bus, every subway, every cab, every bus stop was just, there was an X-Men Apocalypse advertisement. And I thought, well, now I'm not gonna go see it because you have convinced me that you need to convince me so poor, so badly, it must be a poorly made film. Vince is something, you, the person who is irritated by them, are the target audience. That's why car commercials are so loud. They want you to be irritated because then you're gonna remember to go to Clay Chevrolet. Bryn Nybor and a few other people ask a really good question, which is whether or not it is actually true and fair to say that most people don't really know why they like things. And that is an especially funny thing to ask on a channel that often talks about why things are so popular, why people identify with things. And that, you know, what Idea Channel tries to do a lot of the time is to talk about um, what about things is appealing and why uh, the surprising 
uh, appeal of many pop culture properties is in fact deep and complicated and important to understand, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that this is a really fair and a really good question. I guess maybe the thing that I'm trying to get at is not that people don't know why they like something, but more that why we like things is very, very complicated and super hard to grasp and involves, I think, a kind of self-knowledge that many of us don't possess. So I think you're right, it is unfair to say that all people in all cases have absolutely no idea why it is they are a part of the fandom that they're a part of, that they are interested in self-identifying by the music or TV shows or movies that they like, uh, that you know they don't, you know they don't they don't understand why they like Harry Potter or the Dark Tower series or you know et cetera et cetera et cetera. Um, I think that you know it is fair to say that there are lots of people who understand why they like those things, but but I do think that insofar as media is a part of everyone's lives, um, it is difficult, I think, it's, it strikes me as a difficult claim to say that most people understand what about the media they enjoy makes them enjoy it. Um, so that's like, you know, that's everybody from uh, you and me who may be sort of highly self-literate and uh, highly media literate but then also like, you know, my parents, your parents, your aunts and uncles, your cousins, your younger cousins, your, you know, college roommate, your, all of your ex significant others that, you know, there is, there is, I think a kind of mm, internal investigation that is required to find that kind of knowledge. And I think this is maybe still controversial that most people don't engage in that. And, you know, I would encourage them to. Sarah Blake, we can absolutely do that. Um, I'm gonna walk away from the microphone, so I might get hard to hear, but I'm gonna, I'll, maybe I'll shout. Okay, Morgan, are you gonna follow me? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, starting up here, we have The Analysis of Tonal Music, which is my actual textbook from, from college. Uh, Grace's Guide by Grace Helbig. Where Mathematics Comes From, uh, with Lockout and Nunez. Finn Brutton's Spam, which is very good, highly recommended. Uh, Don Newth's The Art of Computer Programming, Volume 1. Uh, Thomas More's Open Utopia, which was edited by Stephen Duncombe. Parmi Olson's We Are Anonymous, which is about anonymous. Uh, Ian Bogost's Alien Phenomenology. Lakoff and Johnson's Metaphors We Live By. That's the same Lakoff who did Where Mathematics Comes From. Metaphors We Live By, also very good. Uh, Weird Realism, Lovecraft and Philosophy by Graham Harmon. Uh, two pamphlets from uh, Semiotext, one by Jean Baudrillard and one by, actually I don't know, I don't know who this one is by. Christian Marazzi, which is about how language is like money. A Downton Abbey box set, The Last Exit to Brooklyn, The Stranger, some Beckett novels, Malloy, Malone Dies, and The Unnameable, uh, The Collected Poems of Mallarmé, This Is Why We Can't Have Nice Things by my friend Whitney Phillips, uh, two Edward Tooth, actually three Edward Toofty books, Beautiful Evidence, Visual Display of Quantitative Information, and Envisioning, Envisioning Information, uh, Asterius Polyp, which is a great comic book if you haven't read it. Uh, Tonal Harmony, also an actual textbook of mine from college that I've managed to not lose. House of Leaves, uh, a book about Guy Debord. The Big Test uh, by Nicholas Lemon, which is the book that we used as the main source for our SAT episode. Uh, Lauren's Sorting and Sort Systems, a computer science book, also another textbook from college. Uh, Eugene Chadbourne's Dreamery. Uh, Eugene Chadbourne is like this experimental banjo and guitar player who recorded all of his dreams and put them into a giant book. It's crazy. It's, it's, it's mind-blowingly strange. Um, Attack on Titan, Volume 2. Um, uh, Sandifer's Tardis Eruditorum, Volume 1, 2, and 3. Uh, a weird Shadowrun novelization. Uh, Paul Feyerabend's Against Method, which you may remember from our Rick and Morty episode. Uh, Paul Pope's Battling Boy. Alison Bechdel's Fun Home. Umberto Echo's The Name of the Rose, which is my favorite piece of fiction. Mary Douglas's Pur Purity and Danger, which we used as a source in the Organic Food episode. And the Oatmeal's How to Tell If Your Cat Is Plotting to Kill You. I think that's all of them. Let me check. That's everything. We will also put a list of all of those books in the description. Lixman893 is upset that we didn't talk about Slavoj Žižek in this episode or any critical theory or the idea that media made within an ideology furthers or advertises that ideology. And if you are interested in that kind of thing, I would point you towards most other Idea Channel episodes. And last but certainly not least, Gabe Berry wanted us to talk about uh, Chomsky and Herman's uh, propaganda model, which is explained in their really famous book, Manufacturing Consent. And I think really, 
kind of just deserves its own episode. Uh, these are th these three theories from last week are ones that normally come together and sort of follow one right after the other. But the man, the propaganda model is like, you know, it's its own. It's very much its own thing, and who knows, maybe a future episode. <laughs>